Hello, my friends. Welcome to season two of Patterson in Pursuit. The show is finally back after taking about four months off. I'm so excited to start this project up again. I'm your host, Steve Patterson. I'm trying to ask and answer the deepest questions in the world and find a worldview that makes rational sense. If I can't find one, I'm going to build one myself. Season two kicks off with one of my favorite interviews so far that I actually shot a few months ago. So I spend a lot of time arguing in metaphysics about dualism or the idea that at least physicalism is false, that there is more stuff in the world than just physical objects. There's mental stuff, and mental stuff's really important. But I get a lot of criticism, and for good reason, from people who are idealists. They're kind of on the other end of the spectrum. They aren't physicalists, they aren't dualists. They think that everything is fundamentally mental in nature. And I haven't really spoken that much about it. I haven't really written anything about why I'm not an idealist. But lots of idealists have sent me a name. They say, Steve, you gotta have Dr. Bernardo Castrip on the show. He's an idealist and he makes a very compelling case. So that's the interview we're gonna start season two off with. Before we start, I wanna send a thank you to everybody who's been listening to the show and to the patrons of the show and my work who have stuck with me through these last four months. When I left, you know, I said I had some writing and some health things to do, and that turned into pretty much just dealing with health things. So I'll gladly talk about those over the coming weeks and months, learned a lot of information about how the world works, how the medical establishment works. But I just want to give a special thanks to all of the patrons at patreon.com slash Steve Patterson who have been very patiently waiting for me to come back and return to work. So I hope you guys will enjoy this interview as much as I did with Dr. Bernardo Castrup talking about idealism. So Dr. Bernardo Castrup, thanks so much for coming on Patterson in Pursuit. You, your name has come up quite a lot from my audience as I cover issues in the philosophy of mind and metaphysics. Everybody says, oh, you got to have this Bernardo Castrup on the show. So I'm really glad that you can <laughs> talk to me today. I'm glad to be here. So where I want to start is where I've started the past few conversations I've had on this topic, which is our apparent observations about the world and then why you think maybe our, our kind of commonsensical intuitions are maybe misleading. So it seems like we live in a world of physical objects where I look around me, there's tables, there's chairs, there's physical things. Everybody seems to have a solid grasp on what physicality means. But there's a whole school of thought, multiple schools of thought, which say, well, actually, the world is not inhabited by physical objects. In fact, there's no such thing as physical objects, or what we mean by physical objects are actually mental phenomena. And when you first encounter those ideas, they seem very striking and hard to believe. But what is your take on the matter? What do you do you think that we leave, live in a world of physical objects? And if so, what is the nature of those objects? Well, when we say physical objects, uh, usually we, we make all kinds of assumptions about what is entailed by that, right? I mean, I, I don't dispute physicality as far as concreteness goes, as far as independence from my personal volition goes. I mean, there is clearly a world out there um, that, that, that is concrete, that will go on irrespective of whether I am awake or asleep. Things will happen irrespective of my personal volition. If I jump off a building, I will fall, even if I, if I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I don't dispute any of this. Now, th the problem comes when we make extra assumptions, when we say that physicality entails something ontologically distinct from mentation, something that is uh, tied and independent of mind. Um, that is an explanatory model. It, it, it's not a content of intuition. Um, it, it's something we add, maybe in an unexamined way, uh, to the intuition of concreteness and in independence from volition. Hmm. Uh, this latter thing is what I dispute. I think this explanatory model um, leads to more problems than, than what it explains. Uh, and I think it's false. Hmm. So with something straightforward like, you know, the table, the table in my dining room, that seems like it's an object that is independent of my, my mental goings on, that it's a thing that's out there in the world that kind of impinges on my senses, and then I have some kind of sense experience of it. Are you disputing that idea that 
No, no. I think the table is independent. Well, at least something that corresponds to the table is independent of your personal mentation. Mm. But the stress is on the word personal mm. mentation. The fact that it's independent of your personal mentation does not mean that it is ontologically distinct from mentation ah, itself. I see. And I think that is the error uh, that our cultural in, culture in general has been making for the past couple of hundred years. Okay, so if it's not the personal mentation, then what? Who, whose is it? Well, nature gives us plenty of clues uh, about this, right? I mean, uh, we know that the, the physical object we call a brain with its activity uh, corresponds to mentation. I mean, if a surgeon has uh, uh, the brain of a patient exposed on an operating table, um, that brain is a very physical, concrete mm. object. It mm -hmm. can be cut. It can be cauterized. It can be touched theoretically. It can even be smelled. Um, it's a very physical object composed of the same atoms and force fields as the stars and galaxies. Um, mm. Yet we know that behind, between quotes, that object, in some way corresponding to that, that object, there is the entire inner life of a person mm. with despairs and happiness and love affairs and heartbreaks and, and pain and suffering and, and successes and all kinds of things. Memories, uh, the food you have eaten and the taste of that food, the mm. smells. Mm -hmm. um, so nature is giving us a hint that behind what we call matter and physicality, behind between quotes, corresponding to it, to it in some way, there is mental activity. So I, I think we should take that hint in the most direct, straightforward way possible. In other words, without making uh, unnecessary philosophical conjectures. And I think the most direct way to take that is to, is to see, to realize that what we call matter is the image of mental activity. That, and, and that's all there is to it. There is nothing more to matter than the second person image, the, the extrinsic appearance, which is mental in nature. Every mm. appearance is mental. It's a phenomenon, not a noumenon. It's the extrinsic appearance of mental activity. That holds for brains, and I would claim that holds for the entire inanimate universe as a whole. What we call uh, biological bodies are simply the extrinsic appearance of certain dissociative processes in a transpersonal form of mind that underlies all nature. Mm, mm. Uh, um, and, and that's why we feel that our thoughts are sort of separate from the rest. That's why we do not experience what's going on across the universe. That's why I can't read your thoughts, because what I call me is a dissociative complex in what we might call mind at large, to use uh, Aldous Huxley's uh, famous expression. Mm. Um, it's dissociated from the rest, at least temporarily, which prevents me from accessing the rest. And the image of that dissociation is my body. That's what you see from a second person perspective. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can rephrase a little bit of that. And if I make an error, then please correct me in what you're saying here. So if objects are identical to their appearances. So uh, if we make that concrete and we say what a table is, is the thing that I am experiencing when I talk about a table, a, a, a mental image. Does that mean that the, the spatiality, the taking up of what we think of as three-dimensional space by those objects disappears when nobody is having an experience of it so so like you know if i look away from the table and no longer have the experience of it and nobody let's say in the room does does it still exist and if so is that because you're claiming that the mind is something that's not personal it's kind of everywhere the extrinsic appearance we call a table with certain phenomenal characteristics a certain color a certain size a certain texture roughness whatever uh, that is not there by definition if nobody's looking at it. Mm. But the mental activity, the mental process, whose extrinsic appearance is the table ah. that will continue to be there irrespective of whether you are looking at it or not. So ah. a phenomenal appearance on the screen of perception is an interaction between a dissociative complex and something outside that dissociative complex. That will only exist upon interaction because it is the interaction, it's the result of the interaction. Uh, but the, the transpersonal um, 
process that is going on outside the dissociative complex, wh whose image, partly at least, is the table um, that, that will go on irrespective of whether you're looking at it or not. Uh, it, it's the same thing for people, right? Um, if nobody's looking at my body, not even me, can we say that the body exists with the qualities that are experienced by an, ob by an mm. observer? In other words, with the shape, the color that a body has. Mm. I don't think that's a coherent statement because by definition, you're excluding the, the phenomenal properties that correspond to, 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 to that. Mm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that my mental inner life um, whether I can access it introspectively, introspectively or not, it doesn't mean that my my, my mental inner life will cease to be if I and nobody else is observing my body. That mental activity can go on. I would say the same thing for the inanimate universe. I think um, the mental processes that corresponded to the inanimate universe before the origin of life, in other words, before the first dissociated complex of mind at large ever formed, that mental activity uh, existed before the origin of life. Maybe mm. it existed since the Big Bang, if we endorse that particular theory of our time. Um, but the phenomenal properties that we experience when we look out in, to, at the universe, uh, those by definition didn't exist if there was nobody there to look. Okay, okay. So would you accept uh, something like this, that the idea is the cause of our phenomenal experience is... Um, mental goings on of the mind at large. So while the, so the table out there when nobody's looking at it, the phenomenal qualities of the table don't exist because nobody's looking at it. But what it actually is, kind of from our perspective, the noumena, it in itself is a mental object. And so that's that why, is, yeah, that's correct? That is entirely correct. So basically what I'm saying is that there are noumena but the nature of the noumena is phenomenal. Now, how the phenomena of the noumena feels like from a first-person perspective is not the same as the phenomenal properties that I experience mm. when I look out to the world. Mm. But it is phenomenal in nature. So there are noumena, but the noumena are phenomenal. Not the phenomena I experience but they are phenomenal in nature as an ontological class. And would you say that we have no, at least in our regular everyday state of mind, we have no access to their actual phenomenal qualities? At least in our regular state of mind, we do not, correct. Yeah. Okay, so this is, a, this is a great segue then into different states of mind. So is this, uh, this sounds to me very much like a... Like kind of like an almost like an Eastern mysticism idea of the of the the mind at large, and then the, we're one kind of disassociated mind that's not connected to this other mind. But there are a lot of people who I've who I've talked to who claim that they ha they have been in mental states in which they see directly kind of the, what you're talking about that they experience kind of the this this universal mind. I've never had that experience, but lots of people whom I respect have had that experience. Is that something that you have had, and is that something that's essential to really grasping the nature of this theory, or is this pure, purely arrived at through kind of rational deduction? So I don't think it is essential at all. Actually, if no mystical experiences existed, if there were no reports in the literature or on the record about mystical experiences that, uh, that sort of um, resonate with what I just said, I would maintain that what I just said is still the most parsimonious, uh, logical, uh, um, ontological explanation for, for the world, for, for, for existence. Hmm. Um, so whatever else comes on top of it um, that might endorse what I'm saying, uh, I, I see that as bonus. Hmm. Um, for instance, uh, psi phenomena, a, a lot of people contact me asking if, I, if, if my views uh, would, would make room uh, for psi phenomena, like telepathy or mm -hmm. whatever else. It so happens that it may, uh, but I, I don't think uh, whatever empirical evidence there might be for psi phenomena are essential uh, uh, to, to, to defend or substantiate the position I hold. I think the position I hold would still be uh, the, better the best explanation, even in the absence of any mystical experience, psi phenomena, mm. phenomena, any of that. 
having said this, I'm willing to entertain <laughs> your question. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it's at all essential to my case, but I'm willing to entertain it. Um, mystical experiences, by, by their very nature, are ambiguous. They tend to be noisy and they are unreliable. That's why I'm so careful mm. about going that direction. Have I had experiences in this direction? Maybe a couple of times, um, but I don't rely on them um, mm -hmm. to make an objective case, mm -hmm. uh, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. because I, I am I'm, I'm very careful about interpreting them uh, right. in, in an unambiguous way. Yeah, I think the so I've had a few conversations um, with people who are come from that kind of personal experiential uh mindset where they have the experience and then they kind of throw theories together to try to make sense of the experience and a lot of times i think they do it in a very careless way and so i from my experience and the research i've done i know there's a there's a knee-jerk reaction that a lot of people have and i used to have towards people that claim any kind of uh, insight in a in a mystical state but after doing research and after having conversations and and dealing with the theories i'm finding that actually uh, mystical experiences are a part of human experience throughout history, and there actually is w a ways that you can completely make rational sense of them. It might not be the the most popular interpretations. You know, th I think there's a lot of, you know, if we're going to stereotype, there's a lot of hippies out there that, you know, think all is one because they took some drug and then they think they understand how the universe works. But I'm finding there's a whole other group of people who, who it sounds like yourself included, have had these experiences and are not willing to entertain, you know, a bunch of nonsensical arguments just because they've had a profound experience. I think it's a problem of translation. Um, I don't even, I wouldn't go even as far as saying that the insights these people have are invalid. Mm. Maybe they are valid. The problem is when you try to translate that into a coherent system, mm. Mm. and that's where it usually goes very, very wrong, mm -hmm. dramatically wrong. And I think the problem you're pointing out is is rampant. It, it's it's widespread. And it's not helpful that people uh, try to, between quotes, theorize in a haphazard way uh, uh, from their experiences. Mm. Um, there, there is a certain rigor that is required for for a logical argument to be built uh, properly and for it to be um, in accordance with whatever evidence we have and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I, I will say one thing. Philosophy as a purely conceptual practice, purely analyt analytical practice is, is necessary because it gives us intellectual permission to entertain certain possibilities. Mm. Uh, but it isn't sufficient in the sense that it will not really change your life and your perspective on the world. Even if you're fully convinced and satisfied with a certain conceptual model and you tell yourself with all sincerity that it is true, it is not life-changing. Uh, my mystical experience is. Mm -hmm. It can be very life-changing, even if you make a mess of trying to theorize around it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so while I think that philosophy, uh, conceptual model, is very important um, as far as it has the potential to drive the cultural narrative, which is a conceptual narrative because it's communicated in terms of words, mm -hmm. and, and we should be very rigorous and careful about the models we entertain from philosophy. I think its necessary complement is uh, a direct experience. Otherwise, things remain theoretical and conceptual, and, and they don't really um, change the world, so to say. Mm, it's an excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up, because this very uh, closely mirrors my own um, path, even without the that type of mystical experience. I'd say I had a, when I experienced love for my wife, that was something that was life changing, experiential. It didn't come with the 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 universal mind um, experience, but it was still incredibly powerful for me. But um, I was having a conversation with one of my friends about the status of logic in these uh, mystical states, because that's something that's really, really important for me in my own philosophy is logical coherence and the, the uh, obsessive elimination of contradiction. And I had had like, conversations with people that were claiming that you could have a logical contradiction, and you realize it once you're in this mental state. And I said, eh, I, I can't square that circle, literally. Um, and 
this the individual I was having had had a little more background in philosophy and said that just like you said, that's a translation error. It's not a literal logical contradiction. It's just that's how it comes out when you try to articulate the nature of the experience. And I thought, oh, okay, that actually makes a great deal of sense. <laughs> yeah, this this is. Uh, this is such a delicate uh, topic, whether there are true contradictions. Uh, <laughs> I mean, people like Graham Priest would say uh, there are true right. contradictions. But if you look at the examples, um, you, you go, you think, well, is this really a representative example? But anyway, uh, I, I think what, what happens is that there is a certain perspective, a certain meta level of logic uh, from the point of view of which things that are contradictory at our level are no longer contradictory. Mm. But what this means is that what, you, what we consider contradictory here is actually a false dichotomy, mm. that there is another point of view, there is, a, there is a, a, a level of insight from which you realize that it is not a true contradiction. So. And then we come back from that perspective and we say, well, there are true contradictions. While in fact, the insight is that there aren't, <laughs> that things that we consider contradictory oh. here, uh, we do so because of a certain lack of perspective. Mm. Um, and then we gain, when you gain that extra perspective, the, contradic the contradiction dissolves. Um, I think that's most of the times, at least, what, what actually happens. So let me, let me ask you questions on that, because you brought up Grand Priest. That's a good example. So there are some uh, examples that he gives. He talks about, um, I think the one I heard was about um, being drunk, where, you know, if, you're, if you take one drop of liquor, you're not drunk. At some point, you are drunk. Therefore, in the middle, there's a kind of drunk and not drunk logical contradiction. I didn't find this very compelling. He gives lots of examples like that I don't find compelling. Are you, are, do you mean something like that level? What's something that appears a little ambiguous, you realize, oh, it's not ambiguous? Or are you saying something even what seems as clear cut as, you know, square circles can be understood as being not logically contradictory from that standpoint? Let's take your last example. If I take a cylinder and I shine a light on it from the side, the shadow will be a rectangle. Mm -hmm. If I illuminate the same cylinder uh, uh, um, from, from its back, the shadow will be a circle. Mm -hmm. um, so from the perspective of a 2D world, the rectangle is incompatible with the circle, and you have a contradiction. But if you add a dimension and you go to 3D, the contradiction dissolves in the form of the cylinder, and you realize that there has never been a contradiction. There has only been one object there, the cylinder. Uh, so th th this is an example of this, you know, uh, 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 gaining a level of insight, gaining right. a different perspective from which the, contradic the contradictions dissolve. And then you come back from that and you say, well, there are true contradictions because the rectangle is the same thing as the circle. No, <laughs> that's not the correct conclusion. The right. correct conclusion is there isn't a contradiction. You thought there were because you're restricted to two dimensions mm. when the, 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 the whole picture of the reality in question was three-dimensional. Hmm. Um, that, that's what I mean. Um, uh, the, the, the example uh, from Graham Priest that you mentioned, I also don't think that's a particularly good example. I, I am more ambiguous about certain examples um, uh, regarding language statements. Mm -hmm. uh, some classical examples like, you know, uh, statements being true or false, the following statement is true, and then the next statement contradicts mm -hmm. the first one, and then mm -hmm. it's, well, they must be true and false at the same time. Mm -hmm. But these are true contradictions in, that, that only exist within a certain conceptual scheme. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I question uh, how representative that is of, of, of an ontology of the world, if you know what I mean. Is that a contradiction just within the rules of a certain game that we invented? Or does that have applicability to the nature of being? So I, I am ambiguous about that. Yes, I think it's the former. I think very strongly um, it's, it's, a, it's a language game. It's a language game that pe – and I, in fact, I would take it one step farther and say it's not actually even a contradiction in the language game. It's one poor formulation of the rules of the language game that yields a contradiction. I think there's a much there's – a, there's a kind of a commonsensical resolution to things like the liar's paradox. But I, I really like right. the example that you give about – the shining the light on the cylinder is a, square, is a rectangle, and it's a, or it's not a rectangle. That's that's a great example because it's a little imprecise, and you see the imprecision, and that's the why you gave the, the the circumstance. But if we're talking about the the shadow and not the actual object, 
then at any given time, a shadow with straight edges is not a shadow with curved edges. And so there yeah. would be a conflation of the shadow with the object that the light's being shined on. So there's these little little fudge areas that you add them all together, and it gives you the illusion of something like a contradiction. There you go. And, and th there are even more, you know, practical and present examples. I mean, uh, the, 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 the cylinder is a metaphor, but we can talk about things that are not metaphors. For mm -hmm. instance, it, there is this notion reigning in society, in the culture today, that um, 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 mind and matter are a true contradiction. They, 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 they form a dichotomy in the sense that they are mutually exclusive and, and uh, jointly sufficient mm -hmm. uh, to make sense of everything. In other words, everything that exists is either mental or material. Hmm. Uh, there's this, this dual aspect monism that is so popular today, even amongst neuroscientists like uh, Christoph Koch and, uh, and uh, some Harris. Um, but I believe that's a false dichotomy. Mind and matter are not a true dichotomy. Matter as a different ontological class from mind or uh, matter as something outside and independent of mind that's mutually exclusive with mind. That, that's an explanatory model. It's a conceptual invention of mind. It's an abstraction of mind. True dichotomies must reside in the same level of abstraction. I must be able to, to tell the ontological status of the two members of a true dichotomy with a single test, like, uh, is this person dead or alive? If I test for the, the person being alive and the test is positive, I know the ontological status of death. The person is not dead. Mm. That's a true dichotomy. The person is either dead or alive. But then death and, and life are in the same level of abstraction. Mind and matter are not in the same level of abstraction. So I cannot define their status with a single test because one of them always requires an extra level of inference <laughs> since, it, since it's in another level of abstraction. Yet we live in a cultural ethos uh, that sort of takes for granted that mind and matter form a true dichotomy. I don't think they do. Uh, so I, I really like that. And my position is um, kind of a third option here where I, I'm a, uh, a dualist. Um, I, I think that I actually do think there are two separate systems that I'm actually not a dual. I'm a, I'm a pluralist. I think there is, a, there is a mental system and there's a physical system and there's another system that, that plays an, an interacting role between the two. And there's probably a lot of other systems all out there that, that interact with one another. But what I, I think you, you said in there that I really like, that I don't think most people in our, in our cultural paradigm grasp is the true status, if we're being honest with ourselves, about physical phenomena. Where when we think we're referencing physical phenomena, we don't realize that always we're trying to explain phenomena we experience. We always tie it back into, well, there's this color blob in my visual field, and if I stick my hand out and I have this sensory experience, I have this sensory experience, it makes me think there's an object out there in the world. But really, it's like we've, we've theorized the existence of the mind-independent world, and then we've forgotten that it's still a theory to explain our experiences. Exactly, exactly. It, 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 the model is now so built in, uh, we don't even know that we are applying it. Right. Okay, so, okay, so I want to I wanna transition to some questions about the way that you're conceiving of ontology here. And you use the term um, the disassociated, or this idea that you have the universal mind, and then we are kind of individual disassociated parts of it. This, I think, is a beautiful idea, and I, I'm tempted by a lot of it, but I don't have a good explanation, and maybe you can help me with, is for what is the, the reason or the cause of the disassociation? Why would it be the case if everything is grounded in this mind? Why would it be that at time one we have the universal mind, and then time two there's like a, a fracturing of it? Uh, to the extent that you are fishing for a teleological explanation, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure one is necessary. Okay. It may, it may be simply the way it is. Uh, if you ask me what I personally sense or intuit, I intuit a teleological explanation, but I'd rather <laughs> not get into that because I don't think it's necessary for, for, uh, for, for this ontology to work. Okay. Um, dissociation is basically... Um, it's it's a it, it's something logical and, and and 
not ontological in that sense. Uh, how do I make sense of this? I mean, if, if you explore the nature of mental activity, you realize that mental activity is based on cognitive associations. There is a certain phenomenal property that leads to another phenomenal property and that's to another and so on. For instance, a memory may evoke uh, an emotion. That emotion may evoke a thought. That thought may evoke an action, which in turn leads to certain perceptions. Mm. All of these are mental contents that are connected together via certain implicit logic, right? There is a certain implicit logic that connects uh, uh, the memory to the thought and the thought to the emotion and so on. It's unimportant whether we can make that logic explicit, whether we can model it or not. I think it's, it's, mm. it's not polemical that whatever that logic is, there is an implicit logic mm. that connects uh, uh, um, phenomenal properties, this, 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 this associative activity that goes on in mind in a very natural way. Dissociation is when two mental contents can no longer evoke each other, like um, as if you had entries in a database and some of those entries are no longer indexed, so you cannot reach them. That doesn't separate those entries from the database ontologically. Mm -hmm. They are still part of the database, but you never get to them because they are not indexed. So there is no logic that, that, that allows for a cognitive association leading to them. Um, so you never reach them. That's what I mean by dissociation. Uh, a, dis a, a dissociated complex or a dissociated alter, alter would be the psychiatric, technical psychiatric term uh, used here, uh, uh, is a sort of a, a, a cluster of phenomenal properties or experiences that are logically uh, 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 connected to each other. There is an implicit logic that allows them to evoke each other. Uh, but they are logically disconnected with whatever is outside, on the other side of their dissociative boundary. Mm. So you can never experience what is on the other side, because no experience that you have leads to what is outside. Um, and, and I think if we look upon dissociation as a primary process in mind, we can explain life in terms of it, as opposed to explaining dissociation in terms of something else. Hmm. Um, and this isn't a trick, you see, because every theory of nature needs at bottom to postulate a ontological primitive and a primary dynamics in terms of which you can explain everything else in terms of that ontological primitive. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a physicalist and you subscribe, say, to quantum field theory, you would say, OK, my ontological primitive is the quantum field. And, and the primary dynamics is uh, the excitations of the quantum field. And these are not two different ontological primitives. Uh, you only have the quantum field, and the quantum field has certain dispositions. Mm. And, and, and that's enough to explain everything else. It can reduce everything else to the quantum field, except, of course, consciousness, phenomenal properties. But let, let's forget about that uh, for the <laughs> moment. Uh, every theory of nature would require you to do that. So what I'm doing is, instead of this objective quantum field uh, outside mind, what I'm saying is that my ontological primitive is consciousness itself, phenomenal consciousness, not your personal mind, hmm. but phenomenal consciousness as a, quote, field. Um, and the primary dynamics uh, of that, uh, we can metaphorically describe it as patterns of vibration, uh, um, uh, that primary dynamics entail dissociative processes. So there is a mm. fundamental disposition in consciousness that allows for the formation of dissociative, dissociated alters. Mm. Um, if you have that, which is entirely equivalent in terms of, you know, explanatory, well, in terms of parsimony, it's entirely equivalent and as legitimate as the quantum field and its excitations. If you have that, my claim is you can explain everything else. Mm. So uh, what I like about that theory is I think it at least is a little more honest for those metaphysical fundamentals that if we want to be certain about the nature of what types of things exist, we at least have to say there is at least mental stuff going on. We, there, it may be the case that there's not physical stuff, but it cannot be the case that there's not mental stuff. We have direct experience. We have direct awareness of that. So we have to start from that standpoint. But I don't think that necessarily means that's where we have to end, to say that's the fundamental thing. 
could it be that the mental phenomena we experience is kind of the output of a of let's say a third system so that so imagine that there's some other ontological realm out there that as an output of it one of the outputs is a physical world the other output is the phenomenal world so in that circumstance the 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 mind is not something that's literally fundamental it's on par with the physical world, but it's still kind of derivatives of this third um, type of existence. Isn't that, wouldn't that be possible? Of course it is conceptually possible. Would you agree with me that this third thing whose output is both the mental world and the physical world, whatever else it may be, even if it is true, it is primarily, first and foremost, an abstraction of mind. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would say that my theorizing about it would be fundamentally an abstraction, but I don't. I couldn't. It, it, that this would be kind of a, a, a nominal world in itself that I would theorize about. It doesn't necessarily mean that's what it is. Okay. Would you then agree that if we could explain all nature without postulating anything other than mind as an ontological class, that would be <laughs> preferable for for reasons of parsimony? Uh, uh, not necessarily. I think it's very admirable and very uh, compelling, but I don't think it's necessary because I rather like the conceptual theory of the mind independently existing physical world. So if there's a way that I can preserve a kind of physical realism in addition to acknowledging the existence of consciousness, I'm very, I'm very tempted by that. But, but I, I, why? why do you want to preserve that, even if it's not necessary to make sense of things? So here's, here's the reason why I think there's uh, something like a physical world, is that it explains the regularity of the phenomena that I experience. Aha, but, the, okay, so what I said is, if you could explain all the regularities of the phenomenon you, you, you experience, if you could explain everything, including all the empirical evidence, without postulating anything beyond mentation as an ontological class, would that be preferable? That, that was uh, my hypothesis. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's fair. Um, if I could be persuaded that there could be some type of mental goings-on outside of any individual mind, then I think that would be I think there would be merits to that theory. But I, I have a hard time accepting that mental phenomena could exist outside of anybody's individual mind. Okay. Then we can reduce the challenge to the following. If it can be shown that all the regularities of nature, the patterns and regularities of nature, including things like the fact that the inanimate universe seems to have uh, rules and laws and to 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 comply to certain certain patterns of behavior that are totally independent of my volition, uh, the fact that we all seem to inhabit the same world apparently outside ourselves, uh, the fact that um, uh, my inner life seems to have a uh, very strict correlation uh, with my mental activity. If we can explain all this without postulating anything other than mind, then that would be preferable. So we can reduce the, we, we can frame the challenge in terms of explaining all that without anything other than mind. So that's the challenge at hand, right? Because if this challenge can be met, then it would still be preferable to start at mind and end at mind as well. I, I definitely see the, the persuasive power of that, but there still is some uh, intuitive uh, difficulty that, that has to be overcome. And I'm not, it certainly can be, but I have not, I've not gotten there yet that the explanation for how, for what this universal mind you know is how it how it operates i i grasp the nature of concepts and ideas from my own perspective but i do not grasp how you get any type of mental happenings outside of myself i have no i have no evidence for that i understand it uh, well that is nonetheless the challenge that i i took up upon myself <laughs> <laughs> to try to make sense of everything mm. in terms of uh, uh, mentation alone. And of course, the moment you do that, the only thing you have to, to be able to accept and to grant is that mentation is not limited to your personal mentation. Mm. In other words, um, to use a metaphor, uh, you have to grant that the earth goes on beyond the horizon, mm. that there is earth beyond the limits of what you can see. In other words, that there is mental activity beyond that which you can access through introspection, mm. through personal introspection. 
you have to grant that. But you do not have to grant that there is a shadow Earth of an entirely different uh, ontological nature in addition to the Earth itself. You only need to grant that the Earth goes extends beyond the horizon. You do not need to grant another Earth of a different ontological nature. I think that argument is especially persuasive if I were coming at it from a physicalist standpoint. I think because I'm coming at it from a dualistic standpoint, I already accept a kind of difference in world. So, so, right. I, so I, think that, I think what's out there is the physical bits and then all the, the mental stuff that I have is unique to my own mind and the mental stuff that you have is unique to your own mind. And the reason that we're having our, our personal experience of our own little... Uh, our own little world is because of the relationship between the state of the physical world and the kind of you know, the rules of the game, the rules of physics or the rules of how mental phenomena come into existence. I think so. So my, my mental world is much, much, much smaller, I think, than yours is. But I could see right. if, if I were committed to the physical standpoint, I think that would be a very difficult argument to, to disagree okay. with. <laughs> I, will not, I will not pursue you um, regarding the problems of dualism, which I'm sure you're well aware of, <laughs> but <laughs> yes. I, understand, I understand your position. Okay, so I got one more, um, well, maybe two more questions for you along this line to, to, in, in the way that you're theorizing about things. So what do you think then the study of something like physics is? Would you say that there what you're doing is kind of studying the rules of a, of a uh, personally mind independent system that is fundamentally physical or fundamentally phenomenal in nature. So, so I, I, if I could speak kind of, I, I guess to put it in religious terms or metaphorically, you're kind of, when you're examining the properties of a table, you're examining the properties of the mind of God, like the properties of the universal idea? I'm not trying to infer, um, to, to, to continue with your metaphor of God, which is a very dangerous word, but mm. uh, it, it's also a handy word. Um, I'm not trying to infer what it feels like to be God. In other right. words, I'm not right. trying to infer what the transpersonal phenomenal properties mm -hmm. are that when interacting with my specific dissociated outer mm. leads to the phenomenal properties I call a table. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to infer that. I am uh, content to establish that whatever the inner life of God feels like, there is an inner life of God and it makes sense uh, uh, of existence in a very logical parsimonious and empirically consistent manner. I'm, 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 I'm content to establish that. Um, I do not feel that we need to elaborate on what it feels like to be God mm. in order to arrive at a conclusion here. At the conclusion at, at the conclusion that there is the noumenal, but the noumenal is phenomenal, like we, right. we, we discussed earlier. So it's not. I'm, I'm, I think I misspoke. Um, I, I don't mean that you're trying to get. You're trying to experience like a trying to grasp what it would be like to have a first person experience of God. It's more like you're you're kind of interacting with ideas in God's mind, something like that. Yes, yes, and I wouldn't even go as far as saying that God's mind is self-reflective or has metacognition the way we have. I would I would think of God's mind as primarily instinctual, uh, phenomenal in nature, but without conscious metacognition. In other words, it, it doesn't know that it knows mm. uh, like we do. Um, um, I would construe its thoughts as uh, very regular and symmetric because we see that regularity and that symmetry in physics. Um, so if we see that in the extrinsic appearance of God's thoughts, between quotes, then there must be some regularity and symmetry uh, in God's thoughts, however it feels like from the first-person perspective. Um, and that, that's as far as I would go. I, I'm content to, to arrive at the firm conclusion um, that nature is mental. Actually, there is a paper published by Richard Conherry uh, in, in Nature magazine in 2005 I think the title was The Mental Universe, and there is a, a statement he makes that the universe is entirely mental. 
uh, he comes at it from a, a perspective, a very physics oriented perspective. I come at it from a more philosophical perspective, but mm. the conclusion is the same. And I think that conclusion is sufficient, at least for the time being in, in this historical nexus we are today, because it has such enormous implications, mm. such fundamental implications. Um, to mention only one, if this is true, then your consciousness doesn't disappear uh, when you die. It expands because that's the end of the dissociation. It's mm. not the end of consciousness. Mm. And, I, and I think that's enough for us to, to grasp and, and integrate uh, for, for the next many decades, uh, <laughs> probably. Um, what I would add uh, in the context of your question is that you know, physics is fundamentally about the contents of perception. Even when, when physics is studying things that are not accessible to ordinary perception, like uh, subatomic particles, we cannot see or touch them directly or, uh, or individually. We depend on in instrumentation for that. But we still perceive the output of instrumentation. And our prediction of the behavior of subatomic particles, in fact, is the prediction of the output of instrumentation, which we do perceive. So what physics does, it's to model and predict uh, the patterns and regularities of perception. And that's mm. all that physics does, mm. fundamentally. Um, so when we study physics, we are studying one aspect of mind, namely perception as a mental category. Mm. But there are other mental categories. There are thoughts, there's intuition, there's imagination, there's all kinds of other things. Um, so from that perspective, uh, my approach is not restricted to physics, although it leverages physics a lot, especially my latest paper. Is, it's a physics paper, fundamentally. It's a foundations of physics paper. Mm. Um, but um, I look at it from from a perspective that encompasses more than just physics. I, like, I think that, that to say that physics is fundamentally about um, perception, I really like that, although I, I agree with half of it. So okay. I think the, the epistemology that is correct is that it has to be about perception. It can't be about anything. When you're looking and you're reading a measurement device, a measurement apparatus and theorizing, it is all mental goings on. But I would say that we're trying to theorize about the external mind independent cause of the phenomena that we're, we're experiencing. But I, will give, I want to give you another um, a, a point on this theory, which is a purely aesthetic one. Mm -hmm. which is my conception of the physical world is one in which colors are not in the physical world. A bunch of properties are not in the physical world. Um, it's very, it's like a, a, a bunch of little gray cubes stuck together, right? And that's, that's, that's well, it, it, it's not even gray, it's not right? Gray, it's entirely right. abstract. It has none of the qualities of experience. So you can't even visualize it. It's pure abstraction. I understand that. Well, it, may have, it may have position. It may have the property of, of the units of matter having position, but that, that's about it. That doesn't get you very much. So, it's too abstract. Form itself, although it, uh, it corresponds to, uh, to, uh, to phenomenal properties, form as a geometric relationship is also abstract. Position, all of this is, is abstract. You can model it, but you can't visualize it without phenomenal properties, by definition. Yeah, well, uh, that is true. You can't visualize it without phenomenal properties. But this would be something like a pure conceptualizing or or or. You, you, can, you make an abstract system to try to model what it, what it would be like without, like a, without the visual, like literal yes. visualizations of it. Exactly. It's abstraction. That's, that's the point I was making. Yeah, I, you, so I concur with you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I would say that the theories are definitely abstraction. And, that, and that I can't say that the theories definitely correspond, but I, I, I can entertain the idea that there's some kind of correspondence, even if we can't even necessarily verify it. But the point that I, uh, I think this is a purely aesthetic one, which I really like, is that your world is much more colorful than mine. <laughs> so the objects that I think inhabit the physical world are not very exciting. Uh, it, it just patterns. And in, in the way that you're thinking about w the world that exists out there, if it, it, outside of the boundaries of our conscious perception, is very colorful. <laughs> it's got all kinds of <laughs> if you were to look there would be beautiful colors and patterns and relations and all kinds of things in there so i think that is a, a point in your favor I, th there would be at least thoughts and there would be something it, it is it is like to have those thoughts so the, the world out there isn't 
abstract from my perspective. Mm. It is phenomenal, although I may not have access to the particular qualities of its phenomenality. Um, but it is phenomenal. It's not, it's not abstract. Mm. I, I, you see, personally, and, and this is not a critique to your, well, it is a critique of your position, not necessarily a critique of you. Mm. Um, but I'm not sure that pure abstraction is even coherent from, from an ontological perspective. From an epistemological perspective, of course, it is from a conceptual perspective. Mm. But the moment you try to derive an ontological class from pure abstraction, I'm not even sure that that's coherent. I mean, there is this idea of ontic pan computationalism out there or, or digital physics, the idea that information is primary, mm -hmm. that mind and matter somehow arise out of information. Mm. And people allude to Shannon and, and, and you know, information theory and all that. But if you look at how the very concept of information arose, and Shannon in 1948 was the first one to to, to really lay it out explicitly what we mean by information, Information is defined as a quantity related to the number of discernible states of a system. Mm. In other words, mm -hmm. information is a property of a substrate. It's not a thing unto itself. It's yeah. defined by, by the configurations of something else. And information is abstracted out of the discernible configurations of this something else. It doesn't exist in and of itself. Um, to say that to say that information is primary is equivalent, you know, to it, it's like that uh, that <laughs> Lewis Carroll said that uh, when the Cheshire cat disappears, the the green stays behind. <laughs> I mean, you can write this, and it makes syntactical and grammatical sense, uh, but it may not mean anything. What does it mean that uh, when the cat disappears, the cat's green stays behind? <laughs> I think when we say that information is primary, we are committing the same fallacy. It's something that we can write in words. But it has no semantic value whatsoever. Mm. Um, and, and I think the idea that at the root of ontology is pure abstraction and concreteness arises from that, it may be like saying that, you know, the Cheshire cat disappears, but uh, the green stays behind. Actually, it's like saying that the green creates the cat. <laughs> no, I actually agree <laughs> with a lot of this. Uh, I, I also agree that the, the way that I think about information is information about you can't have information dangling out there by itself. I think numbers work the same way. You can talk about the number four, but if you if you want to talk about something, it's got to, you got to have units. You can, I, I agree that dangling abstractions are very dangerous, but where I disagree is to say that uh, it would be impossible for such an ontological realm to exist. So, oh, I, I concur with that. Okay, so yeah, that my perspective as I think is actually close to yours in terms of how honest we have to be about our epistemological claims is I, can, I will not say, because I can't say, that there is definitely uh, a physically existing world. I can't say that. And even when I've talked about, I think that information plays a very essential role in how the world operates. But, the, but my only way of understanding is an information is still mental. So, so I'm saying that the physical world or any mind independent world is, has to be 100% a guess. It is a theory that we're saying it might correlate to the world. If it does correlate to the world, it can explain the phenomena that we experience in this way. But I think it is it is naive to think that somehow, like uh, the Cheshire Cat's a good example, that somehow you kind of you theorize about the world and then you try to remove yourself from the theory and then claim that it still is persisting by itself and somehow you have knowledge about that. I, I, I think yeah. that's impossible. I have two quick comments to make about this, if I may, if we have time, yeah, uh, certainly. Steve. Uh, I agree with you that we cannot categorically say that there cannot be a physical world. I even agree that we cannot categorically say that ontic pan computationalism is false. But I don't think that that's the point, uh, because there are many, many, many things that we cannot categorically say mm -hmm. are false. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's an, it, I mean, it's a universe of things that we <laughs> cannot definitely falsify. Uh, so it doesn't mean much to say that we cannot categorically say that it's false. It, it means very little, if anything. The point is, what makes more sense to entertain as a plausible hypothesis? Because the number of implausible hypotheses that cannot be categorically falsified is just mind-boggling. Sure. So th th that, that's one comment I wanted to make. And, and the second comment I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll respond to that one, and then um, maybe, maybe we'll remember while I'm uh, responding to that one. So I, I agree, actually. <laughs> uh, 
However, I, because I'm so persuaded by this one particular theory, I don't think the theory of the physical world is any old arbitrary theory. I think that's a very, very powerful way to explain regularities in our experience. And, and, I, and I would turn around and say this, that I have an easier time intuitively accepting the notion of the, the mind, the, the physical world in which there is no mind than I do accepting a mental world in which there is not my not a personal perceiving of. So that so just like there's the chat, you know, why would we entertain the idea that there's a physical world that's mind independent? I would say, well, why would we entertain the idea that there's a mental world that's kind of personal consciousness independent? I see it as kind of the same. We're just speculating to try to create a metaphysics to explain our experience. Well, both would explain the patterns and regularities of nature, but one would require an ontological step that the other doesn't. One would require postulate an ontological class to which you have no direct access. And the other one would just require extending an ontological class that you already know to exist uh, uh, to extrapolate that class beyond your the, the boundaries of your introspection. But I have no experience whatsoever of of mind outside of the boundaries of my own experience. I have no experience. So, I, I would say that's a new class of thing. Well, it, it's the same class, but it's just something that you cannot access introspectively. I, I mean, you, unless you are a solipsist, you always have to postulate something beyond personal experience. If you do not do that, you're a solipsist. But can't we say that the, in terms of certain foundations, you have to start from solipsism in the sense that this is the thing that I know exists and everything else is theoretical speculation? Yes, but there is better and worse theoretical speculation. There's <laughs> theoretical speculation that requires lots of postulates um, oh, and, sure. and theoretical speculation that requires less. I, I would say that extrapolating an ontological class you already know to exist beyond the boundaries of your introspection is better hmm. than to infer uh, the existence of a completely abstract and totally different ontological class hmm. to which you have no inkling of what it could mean. I think this might be, we're kind of bringing it all together, I think this might be where the power of experience comes into play. Because I have no experience of anything mental outside of my own mental goings-on, so I have a hard time accepting that that's more plausible than the, than the physical world. If it were the case that I had the, this experience that lots of people claim that they have, where I kind of, my boundaries kind of dissolve and I have a, that type of experience, then I think I would, have a, I, I would probably agree with you. But since I don't okay. have that experience, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I'm not persuaded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. So I, I would then invite you to have a look at my papers and your listeners uh, to have a look at my paper and see if I, if I succeed in making a case for this or maybe not. Uh, yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll link to the work that you're doing. This has been an awesome conversation. I feel like we, we agree a lot on the fundamentals here. And um, I, I'd, I'd really love to have you back on the show and keep exploring these ideas because where we agree is on the, the kind of primacy of when we're developing theories, we have to start with the mind. I think that is such an important insight that is completely lost in modern discourse. And it's such a huge one that has these gigantic implications. And even we didn't really get into it in this conversation, but this is it's not a stretch of the imagination to see where this leads in terms of religious ideas, because now, suddenly, if it's the case that we have a rational basis for entertaining this kind of universal mind, well, go figure, there's been people for thousands of years who have been trying to develop systems of knowledge and, and dealing with the implications of that. that. That's, of course, what they call God. So it's a, it's a huge yeah. deal. Sure, I'll be glad to come back. All right, thanks so much. All right, that was my conversation with Dr. Bernardo Castrip. I'm definitely going to have him back on the show. So thanks, guys, for the great recommendation. Be sure to tune in next week because, at long last, my conversation with Dr. Thaddeus Russell about postmodernism is going to take place. We've kind of been in the works for this one for maybe a solid year, but it's finally going to happen. I can't wait for it, and I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy it. We're going to be talking about not just the philosophy of postmodernism, but about the big ideas like whether or not objective truth exists, and if so, how could we ever know about it? So if you're interested in those questions, that'll be up next Sunday. All right. Thanks, everybody. More philosophy next week.